Hi, good morning and welcome. My name is Laura McHenry and I run Teliums Marketing here in EMEA. And I am delighted you've decided to, to join us on today's live event. Coming up shortly, Dave Coplin from the Envisioners will be taking us through his ideas about what data can drive us to deliver as marketers um, and how we can deal with the situation we're in and what comes next. And if you watch his regular live stream, The Rise of the Humans on YouTube, you will know you are in for a treat. After that, we're going to be addressing as many of your questions as we can. Um, Dave and I are going to be joined in a chat with Jazz Sidduk and Julian Brewer, both heavyweight financial services alumni, with Jazz now founder and CEO of Stormbright, and he helps organizations get real value from their global data solutions and their predictive models. Julian's now head of insight at Zesty, and we owe him a big thanks for jumping in today when our original panelist, Adrian, unfortunately wasn't able to make it. But as Adrian's ex-boss, I know Julian is going to bring uh, tons of insight and then some. So a number of you submitted some questions in advance for our panel. And anyone who wants to ask a question as we go, you can pop it in the question box here. If you think we're talking rubbish, please tell us. If you agree, please chip in. We want this to be a dialogue. We want to hear from you. This isn't a lecture by any stretch of the imagination. Before I hand over to Dave, I just want to lay out what I hope you'll take from this and what we mean today by talking about the new normal. These two words, new normal, have become quite incendiary and divisive at the moment. Um, I'm sure many of you, like me, are big Mark Ritson fans. Uh, and almost on cue this week, uh, Mark wrote a piece in Marketing Week entitled the new normal is just another bullshit line marketers have swallowed. So thanks, Mark. It's not awkward at all. Um, and in it, he rails against charlatans claiming that all business models moving forward are worthless. All existing marketing campaigns are invalid. Uh, consumer behavior is never going to be the same again. No one's going to shop the same way, bank the same way, travel the same way. And that now is the time to change or die. Um, and in response to the command change or die, writs and reposts that we should actually sit down, calm down and stop talking rubbish. And if you read much writs and you'll know I've had to really PGify that sentence for the pre-watershed audience. So although I'm here on a live stream called Embracing the New Normal, I do to a certain extent agree with Ritson. This is not the time for rash or hasty actions. This isn't the time to throw the baby out with the bathwater. We really don't know what's going to happen next. I think that's the point. Um, unless you've got a crystal ball tucked away somewhere and it's working really well for you, no, nobody knows. We don't know how consumer behavior is going to change. But what I think we can take from this period, what's been highlighted for us, is there are areas where we as marketers are sometimes a bit rubbish. Um, and we can all name companies right now that were just not prepared to deal digitally with their customers. So although we can't predict the future, we know right now that your customers have really increased their awareness of how you're engaging with them in the digital world. They've noticed if you can't tie their profile together, their actions together across multiple channels. I mean, they're probably not saying that. What they're probably saying is, why are they emailing me about savings accounts when I've got a savings account? They're probably saying, why are they advertising a skirt to me that I bought last week? They're probably saying, how many lawn mowers do they think one person really needs in their life? So they're noticing if you're not delivering useful, relevant, exciting, engaging communications with them. I've been in MarTech for quite a while. And when I speak to marketers about their digital transformation strategy, for want of a, a better phrase, everyone can see the benefits. Everyone agrees that tying all touch points together, getting rid of data silos, getting a solid customer data platform in place, basing it all off a really robust data layer will deliver benefit after benefit after benefit. And then they always say, it's something we're considering next year. And I think that's kind of the problem. We can spot now the brands that have been saying, we're going to think about that next year. So 
I'm not saying we're going to end up in some kind of post-apocalyptic Orwellian future, but customers are expecting more from us right now, and they'll continue to expect that. Their expectations have been raised. And I think the companies that are embracing that are really drawing a line in the sand for the rest of us to live up to. So my hope today is that someone says something that makes you think, makes you smile, gives you an idea, maybe helps you out with something. I think as a group, we marketers are naturally resilient. And this is about taking this time to reflect about how we deliver a customer experience that now goes ahead and exceeds their expectations. And on that note, Dave, I'm going to hand over to you. That's brilliant, Laura, and what a fantastic introduction as well to this session. So uh, first of all, uh, you'll find out a bit more about who I am and why I'm here in a second. But I just wanted to say this is a really big opportunity for us all. I've spent the last 12 weeks getting bombarded by a whole series of invitations to webinars and online events. And do you know what? Um, I wanted this one to be different. This is really about a two-way dialogue. And I think the scene that Laura has just set about how do we find the right balance and whether you love or hate the new normal into whatever we're going to emerge into, we'd love to hear your voice. So use the chat on the YouTube channel. Uh, we've already got some questions and, and we'll go through. But you know, before we do that, I guess one of the reasons that I'm here is to set some of the stage in terms of uh, the role of data in all of this um, so uh, you know I have worked in the tech industry for the last three decades uh, I've worked with or for the world's largest technology companies I started my career with Apple and I've just come out of uh, well just three years ago I came out of 12 years at Microsoft and my position has always been to be this sort of pragmatic optimist about the role that technology can play in our society really specifically about how it can change how we live work and play and uh, you know, to help with that, I used to uh, write case studies for a living. And you know that case studies are always a bit problematic because they always start with some pithy business problem, big UK brand name in the middle, and then some technology at the bottom. Frankly, nobody really cares. So I started to write books instead. Um, and, and the important thing about the books, number one, A, that they're free. So you can get them on Amazon if you have a Kindle or tweet me and I'll send you a download code. Uh, but secondly, um, they are they, they set the scene for a world that actually we're now in in terms of working in a completely different way educating our kids in a different way using data and ai to do things different now we've been forced here um and actually you know in a way it's kind of weird we've been forced here because i've been trying to get people to do this for, for years but it's given us some interesting perspective and interesting things that that we can do in terms of how we think about the world and look you, you know i'll make no bones about you i'm here as a, a thought leader uh, and you know that thought leaders can't just have opinions and so I'm supposed to, this is my statistics slide to prove to you uh, that data is really important to your business. I mean, seriously, do I, do I have to do that anymore? Uh, we get that data is important, but actually it's really about understanding how to use that data best. Now, for years, I've used this analogy, analogy uh, with clients and customers about trying to get them to understand the true value of data doesn't come from the data alone. It comes from when you pull all of the data together and you bring it together to gain what I call a systemic view, being able to look truly left to right because when you look left to right like that when you can put all of the pieces of the puzzle together your view of the world changes and this was always my example it's slightly politically incorrect in a, in a world of uh, environmentally friendly approaches but it kind of illustrates the point and the question i would ask you and i'm going to ask you right now is which of these two cars would you say is better for the planet i've got a toyota prius and a land rover defender now i'm sure um some of you think it's the toyota prius i'm sure some of you expect that this is a trick question uh, and it's the land Rover Defender and the point is actually it just depends it depends on what data that you want to look at and typically what we do as organizations is we take the data that's readily accessible that's all ready to hand and typically that's narrow siloed data in my example let's look at fuel consumption and of course if you look at fuel consumption the best of these two vehicles for the planet is the Toyota Prius I mean that thing runs on water and pixie dust hugs trees when you drive by not like a Defender and we know you know terrible sort of uh, fuel consumption but the Americans, they did a really brilliant study back in 2008. They did something called a dust-to-dust -dust study that looked at from the creation of the components through to the point at which the vehicle is thrown on the scrap heap. The best of these two vehicles for the planet is actually the Land Rover Defender. Now, why? Well, because uh, over the last 70 years, 67% of every Land Rover ever made is still on the road. You can't break these vehicles. Trust me, I've tried several times. And if you do manage to, to break them, you can typically fix them at the roadside with bubblegum and baling twine. 
Now, now look, the point of this example is not to advertise Land Rover cars, although if any of you have got connections out there and they're looking for sponsorship opportunities, clearly I'm available. The point is, look what happened to the question when we added more data. The answer fundamentally changed. And my proposition to you, and especially now in the world that we're living in right now, in the situation we're in right now, is the principle is so true. There is not a single question that you're asking of yourselves, your team, your organization that will not fall prey to this principle. Your job, and probably the reason you're here, is to find out how you can get as much data as possible. Because you know the more data you have, the more significant the answer is going to become. Your job is to smother yourselves with data because it changes how we see the world. And for me, it's kind of interesting because if we look at how we were using this data and data is, you know, really the thing that powers our algorithms, we were able to use this data to, in many cases, accurately predict the future. Now, some of the best projects I did at Microsoft were predictive data projects. We did, um, uh, we did the not the last Football World Cup, but the one before that, and we predicted 15 out of 16 World Cup game outcomes. Got them all right. We did the Scottish referendum in the UK. We got that right within 2% of the public vote. We even did, and this was the highlight, of my uh, Microsoft career. We did the Eurovision Song Contest, oh yes. And the point is, we were able to pull all of that data together, analyze sort of historic performance, bring in other forecasts, and do something that was quite, you know, amazing that we were able to do that with such accuracy. But there's the problem, there's the, the challenge, you know, it's AI that makes this possible. And we talk so much about AI and how AI is really driving everything. But we often forget that AI is just the engine and the engine is important, don't get me wrong. But without the fuel and data is the fuel, it's going to go nowhere. And our challenge is, as we move forward, um, we have to understand a bit more about how this relationship between data and AI works, because it changes how we're going to use data as we move forward. And this, again, is an example I often use with people to give them some insight to how the algorithms work. And it's based on some research from Cambridge University in the late 90s. But it's, it's based on a principle of how the human brain actually learns, which is a little bit counterintuitive to the way that you think the human brain learns. So just for a minute, close your eyes, cast your mind back to when you were uh, learning English at school, right? It, learning English language. And you were learning, I guess your perception would be that you're learning the rules of the English language. You're learning the, the logic of language. And this is, doesn't just work in English. It works in whatever is your native language. And what the research showed is, actually, um, if I take some, wor some words, as long as I keep the first and last character in the right place, I can mix up all of the other characters and your brain will still be able to read the words. And, and what's happening at that moment is when your brain is presented with something as ambiguous as this, it's not calling on the rules of language or the logic of language. It's calling on your personal pattern of language. Every time you read something, you're refining your own algorithm in your brain about the pattern of, of language. And, and this is exactly how algorithms work. They need a pattern. Once they've been provided with the pattern, then they're able to make sense of the world around us. And this is how Amazon predicts what you're going to buy next. This is how the finance company decides whether you're going to get a mortgage or not all of these things are based on patterns of behavior which you know to date has actually been really good we enjoy the experience that we get but once in a while a big event comes along now some people refer to the pandemic as a black swan um, I like to be a little bit nerdy about it there's actually a concept called a black elephant which is where you've got a, a, something on the scale of the black swan so something that fundamentally changes everything but unlike a black swan which is something that nobody anticipated I would argue that a number of people did anticipate a pandemic we're quite vocal about it but we chose to do nothing but it doesn't really matter we're in a world now where our behavior has fundamentally changed and this this is causing us some challenges because if you think in a world of algorithms based on the patterns of behavior that we've seen algorithms work on correlation they don't think about causality look at the challenge that we've had in some of our online uh, shopping experiences over the last 12 weeks especially the last sorry the first few weeks when we went into lockdown and what you would see is that our patterns of behavior were changing uh, the way in which we would make our choices. So in the old days when I'm shopping online, I'd be looking for something that would be relevant for the time of year or the thing I'm about to do. And I'm looking at price and I'm looking at quality and all those things are important to me. Well, in the lockdown period, actually, there's something very different that's important to me. And that's, can you bloody get it to me on time and in a way that I need? Or, or do you even have it? And, and, and if you have it, I'll take the inferior brand, you know, as opposed to having nothing. Now, we humans, we understand causality. We understand that there is a situation happening here that's causing humans to behave in a different way. 
but the algorithms don't understand causality. They only stand, co understand correlation. So they're still using the old pre-pandemic correlation, which is why some of the things have been less efficient. Also, uh, some of the challenges we have is it comes about the bias that finds its way into algorithms. Remember back to the earlier point of principle where we have, you know, data is used to train the algorithms. Data is used to provide the patterns that the algorithms use to provide their results. The problem with all data is all data, without exception, is generated by human beings. Even if it's physically generated by a machine, a human being has said what data to capture, what data to record, and what data to present. And the problem with us human beings is we are riddled with cognitive biases. The average human being carries around 188 separate cognitive biases which frame and shape everything we see and do in the world around us. And as you can imagine, these biases, they, they are imbued in the data that we use and, and come out in the algorithms and the results of the algorithms. Well, many of the biases that we've been using actually are no longer relevant in a pandemic world. And the teapot here is just the example of bias is about if you think about making a cup of tea, there's actually several different algorithms in how you make a cup of tea. So typically I would like some loose leaf tea going into a warm teapot, with, uh, which will be scalded with boiling water, left to steep for a few minutes and it goes into a mug with a splash of milk at the bottom. That's my algorithm for making tea. That's my pre-pandemic algorithm for making tea tea in a world where I'm lucky if I can bloody get any tea bags or milk you know I'll take anything and so I'm completely different in terms of my biases and the point of all of this is bringing it all together is that you realize that unless we start to think about how our patterns of behavior have changed as consumers as employees as employers and also how we think about how our biases change and think back to my online shopping example what is more important to me now is whether you can get me the product or not not whether i choose product a over product b uh, based on quality or price or whatever i'll take it if you can just bloody get it to me how do we build all of those things into the the new systems that we build and it speaks back to Laura's point earlier which is this is not about throwing the baby out with the bathwater. there's still a lot of models a lot of our behavior that hasn't changed but it's understanding where the balance lies and uh, you know in terms of just sort of wrapping this all up and getting into the group discussion I wanted to leave you with a few things that really start to frame that the first is this simple pr principle now remember I'm a technology guy come on I've got a goatee beard and a ponytail how much I, I, like all I needed is really is a Star Trek t-shirt on and you would really understand who I am but the point about computers is they're more or less useless and and why I say that is because they're a tool like anything else and the best way I can articulate this is to use a quote from Pablo Picasso who in the mid 60s he's being asked by some art magazine about hey Pablo what do you think about computers and even though the computers in Pablo's Paris in the mid 60s are different to the computers you have in your pocket and on your desk his answer was brilliant because he just said computers are useless all they can give me is answers what I really need is something that can ask the right questions. And, and for me, if you take nothing else from this session, it's this. Your bloody job, and I'm getting quite pointy now, is you've got to ask the right questions. What are the questions that as an organization, as a team, as an individual, that you really want to be able to answer? And if you can figure out what those questions are, if you can be really crisp and clear on those questions, then and only then can you start to think about the data that you need and how you move forward. And, and it is about data, right? All of this is about data, but so much of the data uh, passes by us and we don't take time to capture it, to think about it, and quite often it swims around us. You know, one of the things I think is so important to all of you right now is you should be looking to get as much data as possible. You should be digitizing everything. And I don't just mean the big tangible things. I'm thinking about the soft intangible things, some of the invisible data assets that live around you, the way uh, your customers come into you and engage with you, the way your employees collaborate with your partners or suppliers all of these things are signals that will help you define a relevant service or offering for the people you care about most and the thing that I think about which is great about the world we live in today is actually it gets easier and easier for us to be able to capture that data and even if I just think about you know our personal lives and this is actually an example from from my personal life you know what do you think this data is all right, so it looks like fitness data, yeah, I get that, right? But actually, it's a very specific 
uh, kind of fitness data because it's actually uh, the fitness data for my dog. True story. So this is Meg, uh, and you'll notice if you are a dog lover, and even if you're not a dog lover, you will notice that Meg is a Border Collie. And if you know your canine breeds well, you'll know that uh, Border Collies are essentially the sociopaths of the canine world, right? And and dear Meg is no exception. We uh, adopted her and her sister a few years ago. And Meg's particular challenge is that she thinks that all humans are sheep, right? And, and quite frankly, after the last few weeks, I, I'm not sure she's wrong. But anyway, um, the Meg's problem is when I take her out for a walk, because she's so concerned that the human being is going to stray from the path, she doesn't go for the walk. She actually does the entire walk backwards. She did it this morning and, and last night because she wants to stay locked on to the human being for fear that the human being might stray from the path. Now, as a responsible dog owner, I got a bit worried about this and I'm thinking, how do I know that Meg's getting enough exercise? And I, I sort of struggled with this for a few months and then my wife reminded me I'm just a massive nerd. Uh, and so I just did what all good nerds do and I put a device on her collar and now I know exactly what Meg's doing I can even correlate her performance against that of her peers and so I can see from this chart you know what actually is the orange line she's doing okay look that's just an example of my personal life and and look we all do this as to ourselves as human beings and many of you will have a device like this uh, that tracks your steps and is it you know there to what, what is it there for is it change your behavior well no it just gives you a window uh, on your behavior you can then use to decide how you're going to adjust it and tweak or treat it it's exactly the same principle for your organization if you're not tracking the data if you're not measuring the data if you're not using that insight then you have no idea about the kind of things that you're going to need to do to make the, the right choices happen and this is where it comes down to everybody it's not just you and you've attended this because i'm suspecting you've got an interest in data um actually the reality is you've all everybody in the organization needs to understand the basic principles of how data works i would argue that you need a data culture inside your organization that doesn't worship the god of data but understands that its importance and seeks to you know use data to provide the right kind of insight to drive the organization forward but in doing that, we can't forget why we're here. And we're here to provide experiences and products and services to our customers. And there's an example here, which is about, you know, one of the industries I'm heavily involved in is the hospitality industry. And if you look at what the hospitality industry is going through right now, it is incredibly challenging. And there are all sorts of things that we've got to do as we rebuild that experience for our customers. But what we have to be mindful of, and I call this outside in thinking, is yes, you know, in, in my example, I work with a big pub and restaurant company and we have to make sure that the beer is great and the food is good but we must remember that that's kind of like the entry ticket to be in business what our customers want from us is to have a great time they want to be at one of our outlets one of our facilities and they want to enjoy their experience they want to have a great time so you know as we think about rebuilding and this is the same in retail, this is the same in office space. Yes, we need to do all of the right things around the legislation and we have to make sure that the social distancing marks are clear. But let's not forget what the customers are looking for in this. They are looking for a safe experience, but they're also looking for a happy, friendly, warm experience in terms of my hospitality example. So sometimes you've got to really think about what is the customer's perspective? And actually, sometimes it's not even the customer. What is the employee's perspective of this? Outside in outside in thinking is one of the crucial skills that will help you navigate through this and figure out the right things to do and i'm going to leave you with you know really one final thing and and there are those of you of a certain age who'll recognize who these people are but i call this the fun boy three principle of digital transformation because you know so much of this comes down to it ain't what you do it, it's the way that you do it so again back to my example of hospitality if you think what makes you special is the quality of the products and services that you offer you're dead wrong don't get me wrong it's not that they're irrelevant it's just that actually they're just your entry ticket to be in business they give you permission to get in front of your customers the thing that will make your customers love you want to come back want to stay with you forever is how you choose to provide that service and i think never before has this been as important as it is right now when all of our customers all of our employees are thinking so differently about what makes a good experience for them or what makes them trust the brands that they engage with so i would urge you to spend a lot of your time yes make the products right and make the services fit for purpose but spend a lot of your time thinking about the way in which you choose to provide them 
And that's it for me. That's the bit that I wanted to do to really open up this conversation and to start us really moving forward. And so let me bring everybody uh, into the group. And you've seen some of us before. I gave you a little uh, sneak peek earlier. So you've obviously got me, uh, you've got Laura, uh, we've got Jazz, uh, who's in the bottom corner, and we've got Julian, who's sitting below me. How are you doing, guys? Hi. Oh, great. great. All good. So that's just a cheeky way of me making sure that nobody's on mute. Uh, so I'm going to start with some questions that were previously submitted. Um, and the question, I, I think I'm going to uh, push this to you, Laura, to start with, if that's OK. Um, and it's a question about shopping behavior and whether I guess the result of this lockdown period and the, you know more broadly the pandemic is going to see a shift back to offline and if so do you think that's going to happen the minute that the sort of the shops open or how do you think this is really going to impact brands that work with really hands-on experiences? Yeah it's really interesting and as you say this question was submitted in advance so we got a sneak peek that we know this came from Lego like one of my favorite brands in the world ever. Um, and I had a chat yesterday to David Morris at Tealy and one of our big brains, and we started working out, okay, so how do we get around this? What could we do? We started talking about virtual reality headsets. Could that be an option? You know, while, while stores are still limited, while people still aren't really going back to them, maybe virtual reality is the answer. Or augmented reality, maybe you create it at home virtually and then you go in store to see what your creation looks like in the flesh. And that could all tie into the data profile. And we keep talking about data, Dave. We want the data. We want to get it in there, learn as much as we can to deliver the best possible experience. And we went off and off and off. And then we stopped and said, actually, do you know what? Two questions. One, is this investment actually worth it for the period of time we're gonna be talking about? And secondly, does this actually undermine the essence of the brand? Because Lego is tactile, Lego is playing, Lego is putting things together. Is Lego virtual reality headset? I don't think it really is. So. I think we have to kind of be careful here because we want to go off on these big dreams, but is that in itself undermining what the essence of the brand and the brand proposition is and what people really adore about that brand? So do you know what we came up with practically was probably what Lego's business continuity team have already put in place, better spacing in the shops, better spacing on the workbenches, and maybe having a little funnel in a corner of the workbench where, where the child's finished playing or adults finished playing with it goes down the tube into a little tub to be taken away and cleaned and then a pre-sealed packet comes out for the next child so sometimes do you know what simple is the answer um boris is talking about us opening up in a couple of weeks for non-essential shops so again without a crystal ball who knows how people are going to engage but i think those would be my two points for for all businesses and all industries that's great um uh, Gillian, jazz you got anything to add to that um, yeah, I actually, there's, and this kind of highlights, there's never one solution to this. One of the points to Laura's comment about the VR, etc., is that Minecraft is one of the most popular pieces of software for children in the last decade. That is basically virtual reality Lego. Um, Lego could very easily embrace that tool, brand it with their stamp, and get it out to children in a platform they're already used to interacting with. And it is basically blocks on top of blocks. Uh, so that just comes to throw The important thing I think that's going to be really relevant going forward is listening to all the different views and ideas that uh, your organization is going to have and coming up with a consensus or actually being flexible enough to experiment with a lot of different options and then rapidly implement the one that seems to work for you. But then also abandon it if it doesn't look like it is. Speed of action and speed of learning is going to be critical over the next 12 to 36 months. Yeah, I've just I've seen there's a comment from Justin that says uh, Lego already have Lego worlds. And, and I, I would imagine, I'm sure Lego have spent a long time uh, thinking about that sort of blur between online and offline and looking very closely at, at Minecraft. 
Um, cool. Julian, I know what I'm looking at when I log off. Yeah, no, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Julian, I just I wanted to uh, come to you if that's okay. And and you know I get this question a lot. You know, it's all right for you, Dave. A, you're a bloody nerd, and and B, you technically you know you spend a lot of time with all these big organisations who've got big budgets and access to lots and lots of data. I'm only a small organization. I'm just a mid-sized organization. What could I even do that would be relevant? What would your advice be to smaller organizations looking to really unleash the potential of data in, in, in their, their sort of uh, what they're doing? Uh, Julian, uh, I love the fact that you're on mute, I'm afraid. I'm not. <laughs> That's all I right. thought we did the sound check earlier. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah, we did. <laughs> and and you know, yeah, if it wasn't you, it was going to be one one of us. So, yeah. So I think it. I mean, for me, it plays back to both the Lego question you had there, but also to your analogy around cars. So um, whether you're a really small size, you're a butcher, you're a corner shop, or whether you are a a mid sized organisation, you have a degree of data that sits within your organization that allows you to truly understand who your mature, your regular, your successful customers are. And that will give you an idea of what their value is to you over a period of time. So in this period where I think when we're starting to look at um, what is the new norm, um, it could be that the new norm for the way that we organize ourselves is to start to understand how the behavior of our existing customers has changed within this environment and really start to look at deepening the relationship with them. And that makes no difference about whether you are, as I say, a, a corner shop, a butcher, a, a baker, you know, a, a small grocer, you've got a good understanding of it. You've got the email addresses, you've seen who's coming to you um, either over the phone or by text or by WhatsApp or wherever it may be, or to your pop-up shop, or whether you're a mid-sized organization. And, you know, going back to the Lego piece, Lego have got a really good understanding, I would imagine, of um, probably the parents who come to them um, who want to buy stuff for um, for their kids or for their grandchildren. And, and they will um, be, I hope, starting to engage with them to really get an understanding of, you know, how many people regularly come back to us? How can we engage with them and leverage the existing relationship we have with them to be able to hold them for when the new norm changes to wherever it's going to be or to be able to continue doing what we're doing at the moment and sell and engage on a regular basis. So you can do it either way. Uh, Julian, I just wanted to pick up on one of the things you said there, because I think it's really um, important. And, and it kind of this is, um, you know, thinking about the way that you do it. So, you know, we're talking about Lego a lot, but it doesn't have to be Lego. It could be anybody. You're thinking beyond the primary customer. And so it, what is that experience? And so we were talking about Lego. And so the, the, we want the product to be right for the kids. But how do we engage the parents? I think look at hospitality again. We've got people wanting to go out. How do we anticipate how they're going to feel about this? What kind of experiences? What kind of changes we're going to need? Retail. You know, we've seen so much now in terms of the increase of people, you know, shopping online, but missing the physical experience too. But they have fundamentally different e e expectations now. And and maybe, you know, this is a question I'll, I'll uh, put back to you uh, Laura about the digital shopper journey so you know there's still this massive disconnect between online and offline so I have a great experience you know on your website the night before I'm looking to buy a TV fridge clothes whatever and I'm there like this is brilliant and then I walk into your physical store the following day and I have to start that entire conversation again I can't find the things that I was looking at last night or do, do you know what I mean what what can we do for organizations and especially sort of their marketing part of their organizations to start to uh, close that gap, Laura? What do you think we can do there? There's, there's all kinds of interesting tech coming out around this area. There's beacons particularly, which, you know, some stores are trialing with greater or lesser success than others. There's also even things like in-store Wi-Fi. So you go and you log into your Wi-Fi and you're instantly tied back to your customer profile and tied back to what you were looking at last night online. Um, if you tie that into a beacon technology as well, then you also have the opportunity to, you know, text the customer, you know, oh, are you still looking for that telly? Would you like Mark from Electronics to come and help you find it? Um, this maybe a few years ago is considered completely fantastical and, and out of realm, but we're actually getting to the point now where that's really becoming a reality. And as, as I said before, as soon as 
one significant brand starts interacting with its customers in that way, it will become an expectation. And that's when everybody else needs to kind of pick up their game really and keep up with it. But online, offline, combining the two has always been the biggest problem. You've got uh, loyalty cards as well, another key way of tying together those two profiles. But it's definitely the biggest hurdle, I think, for companies out there. Chaz, uh, have you got a perspective online on the boundary between online and offline? Um, yeah, uh, it's not as insurmountable as a lot of organizations still think it is, to Laura's point. Uh, the technology has been around to enable this for some time, and I, I hope I'm not going to shock anyone. Whilst we rely a lot on technology, we are not at the pinnacle of high tech. Beacons existed and uh, around. I went to Japan about 15 years ago. They already had phone beacons that sensed you as you approached a store. Uh, the challenge that a lot of people are going to have isn't the implementation of the technology itself. It's having a organizational culture that can embrace it. Uh, people have often, especially with the large organizations I work in, I often see a real disconnect between what we used to do and what people have grown up in that organization doing, i.e. for banking branches, face-to-face, -face, and a disconnect from their digital department. They've often been seen as two separate entities. Um, that can't happen anymore, especially now with the fact that we've gone through an extended period of time where people have had no choice but to embrace the benefits and the opportunities that the digital channel has presented when physical sale has disappeared. Um, and the point I'm trying to get to, and I've kind of meandered a bit, is that linking those two together is not a technology boundary, it's a culture boundary. You need to get the decision makers to be aware of that, that they can actually do it and it makes a difference. Well, absolutely. And, and I love the point that you're making about culture. And, and Julian, I'm going to sort of throw this uh, towards you. Uh, and, and it builds on a, a comment made by uh, Technology for Life on the live stream, talking about how retail uh, could use this opportunity of, of, you know, bringing the online and offline worlds together to create a more accessible experience. So, you know, thinking in particular about people who have different kind of abilities and uh, enabling access to them to features that were previously available either in store or online, but not just them. I mean, Julian, do, do you think there's an opportunity for us to sort of, uh, I don't know, I'll probably go too far now, but to completely redefine our concept of, of retail, uh, given what people are doing now? I think it's less to do with redefining the purpose of retail, how retail works. It's how do you redefine the engagement you have with the end customer and make it in their interests to be able to merge those two worlds for it. So I, I'm thinking of premiership fan clubs. Um, when you, if you have the app open and you attend the game, when you go into the uh, stand and you put your ticket in, they know it's you that's arrived. They can then offer you discounts over and above what somebody who's just a a visitor or coming from another club coming in and, and that's really a it's a rudimentary example but it shows you how you can merge those two worlds of the digital world where you go and look at your fan replays or it might be and then when you go to the physical world you get the benefits of it as well so it's it's i always tie it back to what what is it what's in it for me as a customer by allowing you to be able to merge those two worlds that's really going to play to the changing relationship that, I mean, that's great, Julian. And I, I want to pick up on, on that and, and sort of blend this into a question that we've had from uh, Phil Winstanley. Phil, great to see you and great that you could join us. Um, and the question really is about in, in a world where, you know, we're using this data to deliver those experiences and hopefully that the cu customer or employee or whomever sees the value in that. What is it we have to do to ensure that we use the data safely and we respect the privacy in a way um, that, that sort of, you know, this whole idea of consent now in terms of how we use data becomes fundamental. And I think it's about winning trust. So, Laura, and I think, you know, fr from your perspective, when you're working with clients, what's the conversation that you have about respecting privacy and, and sort of working towards the safe handling of data, but without, you know, locking it away so that you can't get the value from it? Yeah, this is a really quick one for me. This is, you know, if you explain to the customer why you want their data, what kind of experience them giving that data to you is going to enable for them, how it's going to improve their experience with your brand, we find that most consumers 
if it's laid out openly and honestly for them without subterfusion, 25 clauses and codicils at the bottom in like six point font, really will engage with that. The, the value customers put on their data isn't as high as perhaps people would assume it was. Um, if you can offer them tangible benefit plus guarantees of security and safety, which in this age of GDPR, CCPA, all the regulations that are out there, there's no excuse not to be compliant there. Most tech now comes with an inbuilt con uh, consent manager, which should be de facto. Um, you, the customer doesn't, I think, get as tense about it as maybe we think they will do. I, I think that's the lesson there. They're not actually can, can that I... panicked by it. Yeah, Julian, yeah, I can, can I see... come in on that one? Yeah. Hmm. So, so I, I completely agree. And that just really enhances the trust level you have with the brand um, if you're prepared to hand over that data. If you're not prepared to hand over that data, that's absolutely fine. But you may do in the future. So you open the door and allow it to be able to be opened uh, for them to be able to hand over that data at a time that makes sense. And that really comes to the fundamentals of how the organization wants to have its relationship with a customer. And if all of your relationship is around trying to cross sell things to customers and, and and you're not interested in what the effect of cross selling could be. In other words, you're essentially ramming additional product down their throat because you think that if they've got two or three of your products, then they're more sticky. That's wrong. So it's how do you make the other products available for them to buy from you? So it's a cross buy rather than a cross sell. That's all wrapped up in relationship and brand. Uh, and how you see the long-term relationship with your customer base. I, I, I love that, Julian. And let me just sort of extend that and tell me, if, I mean, I know I'm going too far, but where I would love to be is where we win enough trust from the customer or whomever data that we're using uh, is that we could start to innovate with it. And, and it's one of the things that I worry about going forward. And it's a balance, don't get me wrong. I'm not looking to throw privacy under the bus. But at the moment, I can only use the data for the purpose for which it was collected. I'd actually like to be able to innovate with it, too, if I've got something that I think will be of value to you and it's done appropriately and I take you with me on the journey. Is that a pipe dream? Do you think I could get there? No, um, I'd like to jump in on... Oh, sorry, Julian. It's all right, Jazz, I got you. <laughs> Uh, I've actually have, with one of the large financial organizations, done an experiment just in this scenario. Um, because we do capture a lot of data that sometimes we can't do stuff with, but we want to. Um, one of the scenarios was where someone opts out of our marketing, uh, but we know we've got a suitable product for their immediate needs. And in those cases, there's softer ways that you can do this. You can actually flash up a prompt that says, whilst we know you've opted out of marketing, we can see you're interested in this product, and based on your behavior, I have a few suggestions. Do you mind if I just share those with you now? Get a temporary consent, have the customer understand what you are actually proposing, prove that it has value to them, and at the end of that journey, you can get consent for long-term marketing. It's a subtler way, and Kings, it's legally viable because you've got temporary consent. You can only use it for the short period on which you've actually gathered it for, but it gives you a chance to give the customer a flavor of what you would like them to see and that you're there sometimes to support, not just a ram for simultaneous products down their throat. And, and do you know what? You're using the data in a conversational way that is acceptable. So um, you imagine if you walk into any high street electrical retailer um, on a Saturday morning, the last thing you want is somebody to come up alongside you and sell, sell, sell to you. But if somebody comes up and says, look, I'm interested, you know, you've been in here a couple of minutes and you're wandering around. If you need any help, I specialize in this. Just wander over and, and have a chat with me. You feel a lot more comfortable about it. You then do the self-selection in your head about the two or three TV sets that you're interested in, and you wander over and ask the differences between the lot. Uh, and then you get into a more subtle conversational relationship. That's great, Julian. And um, so we had another uh, comment in uh, uh, from Technology for Life again, and I like this, and especially because it speaks to some examples in hospitality. Um, what we're seeing now is a, a rapid adoption of the sort of the online uh, implementation in an offline experience so if you think in hospitality now before we were desperate to get our customers to come a bit like you know the mcdonald's experience or the order at table or pay at table whatever it might be use your device order the food it'll be brought to you or whatever 
is there something that we can uh can we do can, do we have permission to do this more now you know do we think customers are going to be more willing uh, to make this happen uh laura perhaps that's one for you um i think in the short term yeah absolutely and you know we we see a lot of organizations already offer that um order on app order in advance and uh, some in starbucks have been up to for quite some time um so i think the text there the text ready i know it's already in place in some hospitality environments I think hospitality is a tricky one. I, I want to go back to my local gastro pub in my village and I want to have a normal experience. <laughs> so um, I think we need to look at, again, kind of like the earlier example, we need to look at what's a stopgap um, and what needs to become a longer term project. I think the text there, um, I think if it enables people to go back to the pub, then they're going to be all up for it. But I can't see anybody really wanting to adopt that as a as a long term way of interacting. I don't know. But maybe I'm wrong, guys. You tell me. Well, look, I'll um, I'll give you my view on that, and then I'll be interested in others. I, I think it's a balance, right? I think where it makes sense if it adds value. And again, it's not a one. Um, it's not an all or nothing. You know, I, I want the efficiency. And I don't know. Look, if you've ever had the experience, if you've been in a busy pub, uh, and God, wouldn't it be nice to be in a busy pub sometime soon? Um, and you know you can't get to the bar but actually they've got order at table and you can sit there and not lose your table and get around a drink do you know what I mean that's the moment where I think oh my god I'm never going to leave um, so it's, it's, it's finding that balance and, and you know obviously drinking soft drinks and uh, healthy food clearly um, so I, I, and that's the thing for me is we've now I think and this comes uh, in the world of work when it comes to flexible working all those sorts of things we've got a bit more opportunity now because the people who historically would never have done this have been doing it for 12 weeks in some way shape or form and I would urge all of you to look to push the boundary not to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but look to see um, you know how far can we go where it makes sense where it adds you know true value uh, to your customers so uh, there's a question that we had pre-submitted actually I want to come to and actually not only was it a question that was pre-submitted it was targeted to right, at you Jazz so get ready for this one so okay. uh, it was a question um, about how do you keep up client engagement during the new normal? What's the biggest challenge for smaller and bus uh, medium businesses compared to larger uh, enterprises in terms of customer communications? So again, big organization, lots of resources to make sure that the customer's well communicated to and well catered for. What would you do for a small and medium businesses and specifically what data tools, uh, analysis tools would you recommend uh, for the small and mid-sized businesses? Uh, okay, great. That that was targeted directly at me. Uh, I would split that into two parts. One is referring back to something that uh, Julian and Laura both hinted, hinted at as well, and some, some more directly, is smaller and media-sized organizations have the opportunity to have a legitimate con uh, conversation uh, and show a more personal engagement uh, method than some of the larger organizations that might be dealing with 50 to 60 million or hundreds of millions of customers. Um, and that's definitely a strategic advantage because uh, I don't know about you, but after 12 weeks plus in lockdown, I'm desperate to have a conversation with people other than the ones I've spoken to. Um, they're wonderful, they're lovely people, but I'm more open to engaging in conversations with people I wouldn't because I do miss that contact, I do miss that engagement. Now, when it comes down to the technology side of it, um, we have touched this as we've gone through. It's important to understand that customer. There's nothing worse than for trying to be friendly with someone and then forgetting their name. Uh, and giving them a, a customer the wrong recommendation is kind of the digital equivalent of that. It shows you haven't engaged, you don't care, and your engagement with them last time has not resulted in any proper data footprint. I'm comparing like social interactions to digital because the line between the two has really blurred over the last 10 years. Social media has broken down any separation from people's face-to-face -face conversations and their digital conversations. And we are actually lucky. Uh, anyone that's tried to make any kind of technology assessment over the last uh, five, 10 years will actually understand that we are inundated with technology options to solve this problem. But it's about ensuring that you have something set up 
a process internally that allows you to bring the right information together into the right place. Now, you can get this through tons of cloud technology and actually the cost of entry is cheap and it's very quick to deploy as long as you have the right people in the right positions. Um, so I would say technology will play a part of it, but as we've talked about and you kind of, well, actually, you know, you directly mentioned the technology itself is just a tool. You need to make sure that you have a conversation, you have a clear message, and that you are actually listening. If you do so, there are a lot of people out there desperate for that contact right now. Well, that was a wonderful contribution, Jeff. Oh, I you. <laughs> oh, I, I saw what you did there. For Thank a second, for... I became really offended immediately. <laughs> um, uh, but yes, no, that was a clever way to use humor and made me look like a bit of an idiot. Thank you. No, uh, no not, in, not at all. Not <laughs> at all. Uh, but it is, it, it's such a, um, an important point, Jazz, I, I think, which is, you know, retaining a level of humanity in all of this and and you know there's yeah. empathy that's so crucial so you know we're here talking about data and we're talking about optimizing our experiences and what are we going to do to maximize you know well actually it's a bunch of humans at the heart of all of this and and most humans i know right now are, are all feeling a little bit sort of frazzled and a little bit um sort of thunderstruck about what's going on and i think there's an element of empathy that we've got to build into what we're doing and i think you know look hospitality is a great example i think the office is another great example we're going to see a spectrum of customers or employees we're going to see people who are <laughs> desperate to go to the pub uh, we're going to see people who are desperate to get back into the office uh, we're going to see a bunch of people who are fearful uh, to go back to those environments or maybe even are still shielding somebody and i think the challenge in front of you all is you've got to cater for all of those people you've got to treat them equally and and respect their positions and provide a service experience whatever that allows them to make their choices and i think that's the the really crucial part of it um look, so that's me uh, you know just sort of trying to round that human part out and uh, really move on to the next point which is a bit sort of tactical but there's a question i think you know if we can help uh, kevin here so kevin's asked um that he needs to help uh, an academic research project get online uh to get some uh, uh, young people's commentary on on uh, coronavirus and social distancing uh, any recommendations on tools or techniques that might support that kind of interaction um yeah, there's a few I could suggest to support that. First of all, kids in general now are all over TikTok. If you're looking for that kind of demographic, it's important that you stay current with the social media channels. That group of people have migrated away from Facebook and away from WhatsApp. Uh, you'll find they're probably more likely to use Signal and TikTok as an engagement channel. Um, and also these are short, snap, chatty kind of things. And it's important as well that you um, position the conversation in a way that's relevant to that group. Um, these are people that are always a very social group and they haven't had that social contact for a while. That's definitely a key area to use to get information from them. That's great. Uh, Laura, Julian, any other suggestions for Kevin? Yeah, fully, fully agree with that. I mean, it, it's going to come down to demographics, isn't it? So tick, TikTok's quite young, I suspect, um, never having used it myself. But um, social is definitely the way to go on this. And you don't need to keep all of the uh, engagements on the social channel. You can keep the basic stuff in there. And if you really want some deep engagement, then you can host elsewhere for, to be able to get the, uh, the remainder of the commentary. But social is the starting point for sure. Laura, anything for yeah, you? Yeah, I definitely think about multi-pronging it as well. Um, do you want to talk to parents about this? You know, I think that's that's another angle. We can look at how we, you know, engage the young guys directly, but we can also look at, you know, I know when I'm on social and I'm on the old people channels, like, you know, Facebook, Twitter and things like that. But I'm always looking at it with half an eye to what would interest my 13-year-old daughter. So you could engage me on her behalf. You know, I think that's another way to to spread that a little bit further as well. We're back on Lego again then, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm just looking at the clock and I love it. Uh, I hope you can hear Meg in the background there. She's um, cheering us on and telling me that she needs to go for another bloody walk. Um, uh, I, I want to start, we're getting close to time. So 
uh, if there are any other questions out there, now's your time to submit them whilst you're thinking about those. Let me go uh, around the table. Uh, and I'd like from each of you, uh, I would like the single most important thing that an organization could do with data to help them uh, maximize their chances of success, whatever that might be, as they emerge uh, you know, into this new phase of whatever our lives are gonna be. And if I could start perhaps uh, with you, Julian. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to go back to the Land Rover uh, example, so um, or the Land Rover Discovery example. So the single uh, most important thing I would look to is your existing back-end knowledge about the customer and trying to link that through to your digital channels. And that'll give you a good idea of the behavior that you're seeing of the people who are true advocates of you. Uh, and then you can use that to be able to concentrate on developing services and, and relationships from from there out no that, that's brilliant uh jazz how about you um have the right people looking at that data um the mindset that we're going to need for the more challenging times we're going to have for the next 36 months three years or so is um going to be driven by making sure that you have the right people making the decisions in the right place um, that is going to be incredibly important in ensuring that you weather and actually embrace the opportunities that will exist after this crisis and the restrictions around it lift. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and I like your sort of time frame as well, 36 months. Uh, you know, I do think there's a there's a long tail here that we've, we've you know, that extends way beyond, um, you know, whatever this new normal might be, there's going to be another one right after it. Uh, Laura, how about you? Yeah, I'm going to kind of do an amalgamation of both Jazz and Julian there. For me, it is having the right technology in place so that you can gather all customer touch points, um, especially as engagement changes now from channel to channel. People are going to invest more in one area than another as a consumer. They're going to start using different methods of communication. You need to have something in place to pull in all of that data together to get a genuine, accurate view of your customer. And that way you don't send them tosh. You send them something that actually matters. No, that's great. And, and I think on that bombshell, um, I'm going to hand right back to you, Laura. I think we've had a fabulous uh, conversation. I want to thank everybody, actually, for being in the conversation, too. That was really my hope was I did. You know, I certainly didn't want it to be slide where I wanted it to be a great conversation. I think we've had that, but I didn't want it just to be us here in the room. I wanted to bring some of you in and I think we've done that. So, Laura, over to you. That was great. I really enjoyed being part of that. Um, I hope you guys at home have enjoyed it, too. If you have enjoyed the content today and the discussion, um, have a think about registering for our digital virtuality of 17th of June, plug, plug, plug. Um, this is a full morning of big brand and industry expert conversations across four separate streams, depends on what you're interested in. And it's kind of the next step in our conversation on how to build a digital transformation strategy that will really deliver. You can find all the details on Telium's LinkedIn page. So all that remains for me to do is give my sincere thanks to Jazz, Julian, Dave, and all of you at home for joining today and being a part of this. And I hope you have a truly fantastic day. Thanks so much.